morning, Grace. Good morning, Dr. Pass. How are you? Well. Are you recovered? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Yeah. I heard it was after the vaccine, really. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe, I don't know, but I believe it's because I myself had COVID and had high antibody titers. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Let's just say I felt unwell enough that I actually went and got a COVID test. Oh, wow. It was going on for so long. Yeah. Which was negative. But, That's good. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, no, I've been okay for a couple of days now. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah. You've been vaccinated now, is that correct? Yes, I went to Morningside. It was actually like a 30 minute wait, not even. Um, How did you know to go there? Brandy told me. <laughs> oh, okay. You in the lab today, by the way? I'm not. It's uh, David Barris. Okay. Just uh, text David. That's what we're waiting for. <laughs> Just a, just a few minutes. Two more minutes, yeah. All right, I think we're all. Uh, here I'm just the only one who's missing is uh, David. Give it uh, 30 more seconds. You can see the uh, PowerPoint, is that right? Yes. Thanks. Dave is here too. Okay, let's get going then. All right, good morning. All right, what are the gene specific triggers for arrhythmia and syncope in long QT syndrome patients? So, this is, let's see, you have to understand that this question is. Um, is, is really not hard and fast. These are just the things that have been uh, identified to be uh, triggers based on long QT 1, 2, and 3, which are the three most common forms of long QT. So, and the three choices are exercise, emotional stress, and rest. So, uh, why don't we start with David? Let's start with long QT 1. What is the most likely or the biggest uh, uh, trigger historically or uh, for long QT 1 for patients? to have arrhythmia. I'm going to go with exercise. Good, good one. So um, exercise is a very important trigger for long QT type 1 patients. 
and probably of all the things I'm going to say, this is one of the most important in this particular topic, uh, emotional stress and at rest. It's unusual for long QT1 patients to have arrhythmia at rest, not unheard of, but unusual. But they are the classic patient in whom exercise can bring it on. They are also, by the way, the patients in whom we believe that beta blockers are the most effective. And so uh, if there was sort of one patient group where you would really aggressively go for beta blockade rather than say a defibrillator, um, long QT1 would be the case. In fact, a lot of uh, experts on long QT1 would say that it's almost malpractice to put a defibrillator in such a patient because whether it would be a beta blocker at high dose or alternatively a stellate gangliectomy, which has been advocated aggressively by the group at the Mayo Clinic, but also elsewhere, um, blocking the beta, the, the beta um, receptors has, is extremely effective for long QT1. So generally it's, uh, now there are rare patients who have been adequately beta blocked. Maybe they had a stellate gangliectomy, they continue to have arrhythmia then that patient might warrant a defibrillator, but the vast majority of long QT1 patients do not need anything more than aggressive beta blockade, uh, avoidance of uh, competitive athletics, and um, possibly a stellate gangliectomy if it is not effective with beta blockers alone. Um, and um, so that's an important point. And that is exactly that alone would be a good enough reason to say that genetic testing is valuable because you could be more confident that the uh, therapy would be more effective with this. It's also the most common form of long QT, which is long QT1. Uh, okay, why don't we move on to uh, Neha, long QT2. Which of these uh, three factors would you say is the most likely or known to be the more common uh, cause of uh, arrhythmia in this patient group? Um, I'm going to guess, is it rest? Okay, uh, good guess, but you are unfortunately wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. it is emotional stress. Um, mm -hmm. Emotional stress, rest is up there though, and you were correct to surmise that it is a higher percentage than in long QT1. Um, exercise, you know, again, there's a tremendous overlap, which is why you cannot hang your hat on any of these. Uh, but if you just sort of want to look at the classic, the other classic example with long QT2 is noise, lar loud noises. So for people who have long QT2, I particularly am careful about reminding them that having a very loud, annoying alarm clock is probably not a good idea. I actually had a patient once who, um, actually a group, of, a group of siblings whose sibling unfortunately and tragically died at the breakfast table when somebody pulled their car up the driveway and honked the horn and it so frightened the person that they had an arrhythmia and died. And it was that death that allowed us to identify other family members with this disorder. Um, turns out a lot of them had it. Um, so uh, loud noises, I guess you could say a loud noise is frightening, so it kind of goes under the category of emotional stress. So if you want to try to remember it that way, that would be one way. And uh, why don't we go to uh, Uzo for long QT type three. Any thoughts on uh, cause of, of uh, which of these three is the most common trigger for uh, arrhythmia? Um, rest, sleep, those are usually Yes, that's right. Um, so uh, rest is, uh, arrhythmia at rest is not uncommon in long QT3, um, but the other, the other um, causes are of course also causes. So, you know, you have to, unfortunately, there's such overlap that to some degree, what we're reviewing here is a little bit uh, unhelpful, but it's probably worth knowing because what I've just described to you, specifically the impact of exercise on long QT1, uh, rest for long QT3, and loud noises and emotional stress for long QT2. I think those are sort of three factors you should try to remember because they're relatively well established. Again, any of these factors, exercise, emotional stress, or rest, uh, can potentially trigger an arrhythmia in a long QT patient. Now, uh, Uzo, we discussed this, but uh, what what type of beta blockers uh, would you use? What are the more, more standard ones that are used in long QT patients? 
Um, so natal oil um, is one of them, and then metoprolol is the other. Well, it's metoprolol is used, but it's mostly natalol and propranolol. Those are the two agents that have been studied the most. Many long QT patients are on metoprolol as well, that's true. But I think if you looked at most of the larger series, they've been mostly done on natalol and propranolol. So typically in babies and small children, we use, we use propranolol. And when they're older uh, and can tolerate tablets, um, we'll usually use natalol. And um, in terms of dosing patients with long QT, there is no actual, uh, there are not hard and fast guidelines on this, but generally speaking, you want to see, um, you want the patient to get a good dose. Now, there is actually very little evidence that high dose, high dose beta blockade is substantially better than low dose, but I think it would be fair to say that most long QT experts believe that high dose beta blockade is superior. And so um, a lot of the more prominent people in the field of electrophysiology and uh, cardiogenetics think that you should have them on such high doses that the patient is actually a little sleepy on the medicine. We're talking like three to five milligrams per kilo per day of a natalol or propranolol. Um, but in the US, I think it would be fair to say that most electrophysiologists will keep patients on a dose that causes their heart rate to be blunted. And so typically, once we've achieved the dose that we think is right, we'll either do a stress test or perhaps a halter, looking to see what the maximal heart rate is and what the variability is. Generally speaking, what you would like to see is uh, let's say a 20 to 30% reduction in the maximal heart rate from what we would normally expect for a patient um, with, uh, who is not on uh, beta blockade. And, um, and, so, and, and one of the important factors to remember, and a lot of people um, have this mistaken impression that the bradycardia that's associated with a beta blocker is what in fact is causing them to be protected. It is not. The brad bradycardia is simply a side effect of the beta blocker. And we use that side effect as an indirect marker that we're on a good dose of beta blockade. But in fact, um, if there were a beta blocker that would uh, have the impact on the cardiac channels without causing bradycardia, I think we would prefer that because bradycardia, of course, um, limits cardiac output and makes people feel a little more tired. And in fact, uh, on a handful of cases I have where patients have ended up with defibrillators because of failed therapy or very high risk, we have often placed an atrial lead and often will atrial pace these patients so that they have normal chronotropy despite being on high dose beta blockade. All right, this is a 15 year old with a history of postoperative heart block who is 10 years, uh, had a pacemaker 10 years ago, so when he was five. The pacemaker lead is entering what vein? And the question is, is there room for more transvenous leads? So I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Kong what she thinks about this. And I should mention, obviously, contrast has been injected in the patient's left arm? Um, I'm deciding between, I guess, a axillary vein, like a smaller vein mm -hmm. versus a subclavian. I, I would say an axillary vein, just the angling of it, but I, I'm guessing. Okay. So um, it's good to know this anatomy. What this is, is actually the cephalic vein. So, uh, and you know that because the cephalic vein generally comes from above and enters into the subclavian or the axillary vein. Uh, so when you see uh, the wire coursing what, from what appears to be above down into the vein, uh, that usually uh, suggests it's a cephalic vein. And uh, Grace, do you know how it is that the surgeon got this catheter or this uh, lead into the cephalic vein? How is that entered? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So the cephalic vein uh, sits under a fat pad that is in the deltopectoral groove. 
Um, and um, it is typically cut down. So it's actually, if you make your incision at the deltopectoral groove and you carefully dissect out the, the tissues, you will see this fat pad and below it in 95% of people is the cephalic vein. And um, this is one of the more common ways in which pacemaker leads are inserted. Um, and in the past, when surgeons did most pacemaker surgeries, they would do it this way. The benefit of this is that uh, the lead, when you place the lead in the subclavian vein, you end up uh, potentially with a clavicular crush injury. You could see that the, if the lead is going between the, uh, I think that's called the subclaviculus, or th there's some muscle here that can compress the lead between the lead and the, um, and the clavicle. So let's just show the anatomy. So this is the subclavian vein and, um, and the axillary vein is down here. So uh, in an ideal world, you would not really wanna put the lead in the subclavian vein if you did not have to, although the majority of electrophysiologists do put it in the subclavian vein directly because it is the technically easiest uh, way in which to insert a pacemaker lead. But there are a number of potential um, disadvantages. So this is the anatomy here. And I'll just read this, that the axillary vein becomes the subclavian vein after it travels medially over the first rib. So if it's lateral to the first rib, it's called the axillary vein. And if it is medial to the first rib, we call it the subclavian. And it lies two finger breaths below the coracoid process, but this is difficult structure to palpate unless the patient is thin. The vein components which overlie the first rib is termed the extrathoracic component of the subclavian vein. And uh, they're saying in this uh, textbook that this is a target for uh, accessing the vein. What uh, I typically do, as you've probably seen in the lab, is I'll use an ultrasound to identify the axillary vein in order to uh, percutaneously access the axillary vein. And the theoretical, I just wanna, I think I have another slide on this. Or, yeah, so basically, um, the benefit of that is that you are avoiding this potential uh, crush that can happen if you, the more medially you enter the vein, the more chances that the uh, muscle around the clavicle can compress the lead and cause an insulation break and uh, have a long-term problem for the lead. So generally speaking, uh, in terms of lead survival, you want to put it as distally as you can into the vein to avoid all of this. Now, sometimes what happens is, is that this area is, uh, is already got leads in it, and so you only have the option of putting it in a subclavian stick, but in a perfect world, you would rather not do that. And you can see here, this is the cephalic vein entering the axillary vein, just as it's becoming the subclavian vein. So, Getting back to our original um, picture, uh, based on this image, do you believe, Grace, that this patient could have more transvenous leads? This patient happens to have a VVI or single ventricle pacemaker that was placed uh, when he was five transvenously. Um, can this patient have more leads put in this vein based on this venogram that you're looking at? Um. I think so. There seems to be space, not in the cephalic vein, it would be through the axillary vein. You could put in another. Yeah, you could. I think that's right. I think you could put one either through the axillary vein or through the subclavian vein. Uh, this particular lead actually is working great. Uh, it's the surgeon who placed this lead, placed a lot of slack in this patient. Uh, which has uncurled in the heart. And um, there is still actually a fair amount of slack. And the patient is not very tall and no, none of his family members are very tall. So I think that this lead theoretically should be, um, probably will not need to be extracted or pulled out. And instead, if we were going to upgrade him, we could just place a second lead in the uh, axillary or subclavian vein attached to a dual chamber pacemaker. Um, and uh, just as an FYI, this surgeon showed, this, is, this lead is a uh, five French pacemaker lead. Grace, what size are pacemaker leads traditionally? What is a standard pacemaker lead in terms of French size, do you think? Uh, bigger than five French. Mm -hmm. 
they are uh, actually seven or eight French uh, pacemaker leads. Sometimes there's six French. Actually, I'm wrong. Most leads today are six French, but the traditional ones are either six or seven French, whereas ICD leads are mostly eight, nine, or 10 French, usually eight or nine French, mostly nine French. Um, so this, at the time that this surgery was performed, this uh, five French lead, which is uh, called a uh, sweet tip lead manufactured by Boston Scientific, was the thinnest lead that was manufactured. And this particular surgeon used to like this lead a lot. It's a bipolar lead, works very well. Now, um, so you now have this patient, Grace, they're 15. Their generator has reached the elective replacement interval. So you are there because the pacemaker is about to go. Um, do you need to upgrade? What's the benefit and what's the disadvantage of upgrading this patient at this time? Upgrade into a by V. To a, to a, well, we would call it a, just a, if you're talking, if you mean by by V, you mean uh, upper and lower chamber, dual yeah. chamber pacemaker. Yeah. Um, what would be the what would be the advantage and the disadvantage of doing that in this patient? Mm -hmm. um, so he's 15. He might still grow more. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be the disadvantage is that we would still have to put in some slack, um, and the wire position or the uh, lead position might change. Mm -hmm. uh, the advantage is, of course, if you have dual chamber pacing, then um, you. Uh, our, our pre, your, your cardiac output is improved. And I think in, if you continue to just fee pace this patient, then he can have um, like pacemaker uh, induced issues. Well, you um, actually have that. You're talking about a pacemaker induced cardiomyopathy, I guess. Uh, you can actually have that no matter what. Uh, any kind of ventricular pacing, whether it's uh, VVI or dual chamber can cause that. Okay. Uh, but, so mainly, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. So mainly cardiac output would be um, improved with dual chamber. Right, so uh, that's right. So having, a, so you're saying essentially that the presence of AV synchrony would improve cardiac output. That's true. Um, let's say that this patient um, has repaired congenital heart disease and has a good repair and has a uh, normal ventricular function and is 15. What, by what percentage do you believe that uh, upgrading to dual chamber, the development of um, AV synchrony will improve cardiac output in such a patient? Uh, I think you had told us before that patients who have been V-paced since childhood seem to tolerate it well. Um, I mean, this patient is actually almost 100% V-paced. Um, so that from the perspective of how the child feels in terms of feeling uncomfortable, feeling canon A-waves, because so you're referring to this condition that in the adult world they call pacemaker syndrome. So in pacemaker syndrome, if you take somebody who has had uh, normal conduction their entire life, let's say they get heart block for some reason, maybe they have a heart attack or something. And then um, you put a single chamber VVI pacemaker in them. Very commonly, uh, patients will complain because they feel the Canon A waves from AV to synchrony. But in a younger patient who has had V pacing, uh, asynchronous V pacing their whole life, it is almost unheard of to hear of that complaint. Uh, so. So we don't have to worry about that because this patient has already been living for 10 years with um, asynchronous ventricular pacing. So from a perspective of, you know, just a bad feeling in his neck and a pounding, he doesn't have that. So we don't have to factor that question into it. That is an important concern though. And for sure, if we had a patient who was in heart block newly, we would take that very seriously, that concern. Um, but I guess the first question is, does the vein, the vein looks like it is open enough, right? We could certainly put another lead in. And in fact, it looked so nice that I actually contacted the surgeon who is now retired from surgery just to show him the angio because I knew that he would be excited to see that his surgery in this, what was then a very small child uh, was a perfect, a great success because he did not block the vein in any substantial way. Um, but the question I'm asking you is, so yes, it is possible that 
by having dual chamber pacing, you will improve the cardiac output. By how much do you think, give me a rough estimate, say percentage, would you improve the cardiac output in somebody who has had congenital heart surgery but has normal heart function? I'm guessing, but I think it would be pretty low, like 20%. It's actually lower than that. It's probably in the range of five to 10%. Oh, wow. So uh, now that's as opposed to someone who has bad function um, or has a lot of AV valve regurgitation. In that type of patient, then the, uh, the uh, advent of dual chamber pacing can have a very substantial impact. It could be a 20 to 30% improvement in cardiac output. So in those cases, it's really a no-brainer. You really need to do a chamber pacing. But in this patient, uh, I decided, I was thinking about upgrading him. And I'll be honest in saying that I think most electrophysiologists would probably have upgraded this patient at 15 because he is nearly adult size. But I chose not to do that because I thought to myself, this patient is doing very well and the vein is open. And all pacemaker leads have a... Uh, have a longevity associated with them. It is unlikely that any transvenous pacemaker lead is going to last the patient's entire lifetime. I'm, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but uh, what do you think is the normal uh, longevity of a pacemaker lead that's transvenous, Grace? I would just be pacing somewhere close. I'm talking about, uh, just so that I'm clear, I'm talking about how long do you think a, a Let's say the lead is working well, it's been placed properly, it's been placed in the cephalic vein, which is one of the best places to put it, we believe. Um, how many years, if you're, so you're finished with the surgery, you're going out to talk to the family, they say, well, doctor, I'm so happy everything went well. How long can we expect that this wire that you placed in my child's heart is going to work? Oh, what the wire. Mm. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? I'm uh, for 10, 50, no, more than that. 20 years? <laughs> so I think that like, um, I think at 20 years, about 80 to 90% of transvenous leads should still be functional. So I usually tell patients that if I, you know, that I would be very happy if a transvenous lead lasted about 30 years. Mm -hmm. Now in pediatrics, because of growth considerations, the number of years of longevity are probably much lower. Um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a paper with that surgeon who did the surgery uh, on uh, our, our longevity of defibrillator leads in children. And we showed a 10-year Kaplan-Meier survival of almost 90%, which at that time was, a, and still today would be considered an outstanding uh, outcome to have 10-year survival of defibrillator leads. Um, but Eventually, this lead, all leads have to be, uh, we, we have to assume that all leads will have to be extracted or that the patient will, uh, or alternatively, will have to use the contralateral vein one day. And so I honestly just decided not to upgrade on the theory that <clears throat> once I place a lead in this patient, the clock will start ticking. And since the patient has good cardiac output at this age, uh, and really will have very minimal benefit from dual chamber pacing in regards to that aspect and is asymptomatic and feels well and is quite energetic, I decided to leave it as it is on the theory that it would be nice when he's, let's say this uh, new pacemaker lasts another 10 years, uh, it would be nicer to start the clock on dual chamber pacing when he's 25 or maybe even 35, then it would be uh, to start it uh, at age 15. And so, uh, because remember, this is a lifelong therapy. So until we have biological pacemakers, which by the way, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, investigation on at the present time, but until we have reliable biological pacemakers, we have to always assume that all of our pacemaker patients are going to end up requiring pacing lifelong. So in this particular case, we took the picture so that we now know for the future that the vein is patent and probably can accept more than one pacemaker lead. Um, but for now, we would not do anything. The other thing I'll just mention interestingly is that this particular lead, the so-called sweet tip, which this patient has this thin lead, also called a thin line lead, is actually apparently very, very difficult to extract. And so 
it is likely that so the fact that my the, apologies i couldn't whoops my series talking to me so mm -hmm. the fact that the uh lead that the that the vein is open is really terrific because honestly um it's very unlikely that we will be able to extract this particular lead and in fact that is one of the reasons why this particular lead the sweet tip is not commonly used very much anymore because people who do extractions when they hear that a patient has this particular model of lead start getting very nervous of course the surgeon when i told him this one day said to me well why would you have to worry about that the lead will work forever but you know being realistic uh, that's probably not entirely true Dr. Pass, when you replace that um, ventricular lead, would you put it, go through another act? If you're able to take the lead out, extract it well, would you try to, would you end up putting it back in the cephalic vein? I don't know if you're able to like rewire it. Or... I, think what, I think what practically happens is, is that you exteriorize the entire, you see there's quite a bit of uh, slack in the pocket here. So you would sort of uh, basically dissect all of this out. It's probably just stuck to a lot of, um, of uh, scar tissue in here. Um, and then you would uh, place a stylet, which is just a large uh, obturator through the lumen of this, uh, through the back of the lead. And typically uh, what is usually used is uh, some kind of a laser sheath so that you take this very, you, you extend the lead by putting this thing that attaches to the back of the lead to make the lead longer. And then you place this sort of large uh, sheath that almost looks a little bit like a Mullins sheath over the lead. And I'm not an extractor, so I, excuse me for this somewhat gross description. And at the tip of the uh, sheath, they have different kinds of sheets that will basically break up uh, the scar tissue that has, large, that has likely formed along the length of the lead. And the most common is a manual device where you're just essentially squeezing something that causes local um, breakup of uh, scar around the lead. Um, and essentially, it's, it's essentially like putting a long sheath over the lead and you keep advancing this over the lead very slowly and carefully um, but oftentimes you end up needing to use a sheet that has a laser on the end, or at least some operators do. Although I know that a lot of uh, longtime extractors claim that you rarely need to use the laser. I think like, for example, Barry does extractions occasionally. I think he uses the laser. And I think the group here at Mount Sinai often uses the laser sheet, which is I think a more efficient way, but probably a little bit more aggressive. Um, and so once, you, so what happens practically is that you pass this long sheath all the way into the, over the lead, it takes a long time because there's typically adhesions of the lead all, wherever it's near the top or the bottom of the lead, it's typically adhesed to the lead, to the vein. Assuming you get all the way down into the heart and you take the lead out, you then use that long sheath as an introducer. You can put a wire through it take out the uh, laser sheath and then place an introducer. So you practically probably end up directly inserting it into the subclavian vein because the cephalic is essentially destroyed as a result of scarring and uh, thrombosis that has likely occurred around the lead. You have to remember that when this five French lead was placed, it probably was, it probably nearly filled the entire diameter of the lead, of the vein. Uh, therefore, that, and that is the reason why when you inject contrast, you don't see any contrast filling in this area at all because it's probably completely thrombosed and then um, uh, scarred down as a result of that. Thank you. Okay. All righty. So we are now, uh, this is an example of a patient who has a history of SVT and um, we are ventricular RV pacing this patient. And uh, the question that I'm asking you is, um, can you tell me what the mechanism of SVT is? I see Dr. Sergey is there. Uh, Sergey, do you have any thoughts on, on whether this, can you tell me what the mechanism for SVT is based on this crisis? Good morning. Good morning. Let me see, um, <clears throat> going through the legend. Um, uh, 
I should tell you that this question or some variety of this question is virtually guaranteed to be on your board exam someday. Of course, you're many years from your board, but it is coming. Um, so I would say it's probably <clears throat> um, what's the mechanism? So it's re-entrant. Okay, but you you yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, and um, I see that the uh, mm, it's strange that on the um, surface EKG I can see that. Um, can see P waves and, and, and QRS complexes after that. But then if I look on the um, high right atrium uh, lead, I see that the there's a spike that, that comes after the QRS on the surface lead. Right. Which, well, you have yeah. to ask yourself, Sergey, when you're looking at that, I agree with you that this looks like there's some kind of a P wave before the QRS. I assume that's what you're referring to. Is that All right. right? But, but it's very close to the uh, QRS. Or, yeah, and remember, I'm V pacing. So it's likely just that the QRS looks strange. Remember also that we're at 100 paper speed. So right. QRS is very spread out. Everything is spread out. So I would say I wouldn't really read too much into it. You're right to be looking at the surface. I'm happy to hear that you are, are looking at the surface. It's always helpful. In this particular case, I would say it's probably a little bit confusing because you're right. It looks kind of like, almost like there's an A before the V, but this is not actually an A. In fact, I think that these are probably, if I were going to guess, are probably the Peace. B waves, yeah. All right, so I'll then call it an AVNRT probably. AVNRT. So if I were pacing the V and somebody with AVNRT, where would the earliest retrograde A be amongst the Hiss? coronary sinus and high RA catheters? Um, his? Be in the his, right? But if we look here, so we have V's here, right? We know we're pacing the V here. So this is in the his channel is the V. And this little signal here is the A. But if you look down in the coronary sinus, I think you would agree that this A appears to be earlier than this A, right? It's a very awkward, in other words, normally if there were not an accessory pathway, we would expect that, um, that if we were going up the node in somebody who had AVNRT, we would expect that this A would be earlier than this A, which is in the proximal coronary sinus. And this retrograde A being more out towards the left atrium would be over here, even later than the coronary sinus, and this A even later still, and then finally this A later still. And the reason for that, of course, is that if you're going up the AV node and you are passively uh, depolarizing the atrium, you would expect that, that the farther you are from the AV node, the later the atrial depolarization would be. And so something near the, car the distal coronary sinus should be very late if we're going up the AV node, as would be the case in a patient with AVNRT, because you would presumably not have an accessory pathway. And so you would only go from V to A through the AV node, and then the entire rest of the atrium would need to passively depolarize due to uh, the conduction coming up the node and then just sort of depolarizing the atrium. But in fact, what we see here is that the coronary sinus, the distal CS, is quite a bit earlier than, or at the very minimum, is on time with the proximal uh, hiss. And so this is an example of a left-sided accessory pathway. And um, you can see here that the operator has a MAP catheter or an ablation catheter, uh, and there is a V and an A on it. And if we sort of just in our minds, I compare this A to this A, I think we would agree that this A is earlier in the coronary sinus in comparison to this A. So this would not be an area where we would ablate. So wherever the operator has this catheter, the uh, retrograde A is late relative to the best coronary sinus. And oftentimes when we're mapping in a V-paced rhythm, we will compare, we'll use some kind of a fiducial point that we can compare our distal MAP catheter two. And in this case, if we were gonna use the earliest retrograde A, which is the CS distal, 
we would say that, you know, if, if I were sitting at the computer and Dr. Love were at the catheter, which actually was the case in this particular procedure, I would probably measure how much later this retrograde A is in comparison to this retrograde A in the coronary sinus. And I would probably say something like positive 10 milliseconds, which would be my way of cueing Dr. Love that he is not in an adequate position to ablate because he is not even as close as the coronary sinus pair. So, uh, so this is a nice example of a left-sided accessory pathway that is conducting retrograde. So whenever you see this, um, what we would refer to as an eccentric pattern. So it's called eccentric because if it's going up the node, we call it concentric, meaning it's going up the normal central manner. But when it is eccentric, when an area other than the AV node is earlier, we call it eccentric. And we're looking for where is the earliest eccentric conduction. And in this particular case, it's in the distal coronary sinus, suggesting that this is a left-sided accessory pathway. So this type of pattern, virtual guarantee will be on your boards. Uh, you know what, I'm just gonna move on to this next one just for the sake of time. So this was a text I received from a fellow. Hello, with very uh, large exclamation point. We have very excited fellows here, which is great. Just wanted to touch base about a patient named Blank. He is blank years old. We're doing this for HIPAA compliance uh, with a pacemaker that's been firing more often than prior. And some seem appropriate and some not. And uh, apparently the last time the pacemaker was interrogated was in February. So um, I'm going to ask, uh, we ask uh, Dr. Uzo, Actually, I see Perna there. Sorry, Perna, I didn't, I've, been, I've been avoiding you, I'm sorry. So uh, Perna, you see this, what do you think is wrong with this pacemaker? I will tell you that the first thing you need to know, of course, is what is the patient's program? But actually in this case, I would say, I would argue that you do not need to know what the patient's program is to know that this is not working properly. But my question to you is what is the problem? Good morning, Dr. Glass. Good morning, Bruno. So um, if I'm going from left to right, um, I see a pacing spike after the QRS complex. And then again, uh, in the second complex after the T wave, and it seems to be like atrial paced, and then there is a following QRS. Uh, why do you say it's atrial paced? Um, actually, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, because I don't see a distinct P wave after that. Let's first look at the right hand side. What's going mm -hmm. on in these uh, four beats? So there is pacing, and then there is a QRS complex. Uh, the P wave. That A pacing. V pacing, Bruno. I'll say that's V pacing. Right, it has to be V pacing, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. if that were A pacing, that that spike to QRS is so tight. There's no, mm -hmm. not even an accessory pathway, not even a WPW patient could conduct that rapidly. Mm -hmm. So that's a V pacing. Yeah. V pacing. So yes, so that's like a. It's an atrial or ventricular pacemaker right there, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's a V pacing. And in the first two so beats. We can say that capture is not a problem, right? It does seem to be pacing, and you see a QRS after each complex, with the exception of this pace beat. Why would mm -hmm. this not capture? Because here we're capturing, but here we're not, right? Is there... It's not capturing. Why is that? Um it's probably under sensing that it did not sense the sinus beat that was there and it paced inappropriately. Right, but what is, um, that's absolutely true. That's very good, good observation. The question is um, why, how, so it did not sense, right? It should not have paced mm -hmm. so quickly after a QRS, right? This is, 
40 milliseconds after uh, a pacing, after a QRS, the pacemaker is pacing. We know, looking at this tracing, that the pacemaker is not programmed at a rate of like 300, <laughs> okay? So this is undersensing for sure. But why, why, so it undersensed and it paced. Why did it not capture? Because uh, we would be in refractory period, that's why. That's exactly right, because the patient is refractory because the QRS, the ventricle has literally just depolarized. What is dangerous about this observation, this particular beat though? What could happen at this beat? Uh, you could have like an R on T and that could lead to VFib. Absolutely. So this is a very scary, very dangerous mm -hmm. observation that there is a pacing spike occurring on top of a T wave. And if it were properly timed, you are 100% right that we could induce a very serious problem for this patient. Um, and this is another example of an undersensed beat, right? Because mm -hmm. look how close it's coming uh, after a QRS. So there's no possible way that we've programmed the pacemaker to pace at this short of an R to R interval. So this is an example of undersensing. And this demonstrates to you why undersensing is potentially so dangerous, right? This patient mm -hmm. have had an episode of ventricular fibrillation from an inappropriately timed spike on a T wave. And so uh, as a result of this, uh, what would you do? I mean, to basically see what is the cause of this undersensing, to right. investigate that. So, um, we would get a chest X-ray, see if the lead is in place or not, if there's any fracture that you could see uh, very obviously. Uh, so we actually went to the patient's bedside. And interestingly, we did not actually, the R wave that was measured from the pacemaker through the device was I think like six or seven millivolts. And the pacemaker had been programmed to sense at two millivolts. So it was a little bit confusing as to why it was uh, under sensing, except to say that sometimes depending on position, uh, it can under sense intermittently, which is not a good problem. So we made the lead more sensitive and then we carefully observed this patient's telemetry and never observed this problem again. So presumably this was an intermittent problem. We checked the impedance of the lead, which was stable from the prior evaluation, which is a good way of knowing that the, um, which is a good way of knowing that the, uh, the lead is intact, the insulation is intact. And um, the threshold to pacing was also unchanged from pre, from preoperative, uh, I'm sorry, from the previous evaluation back in February. So really the only uh, notable change was the sensing. And uh, this is one of the reasons why some electrophysiologists will get halter monitors on patients looking to see if there are intermittent problems that are not observed during an office visit. This would be such an example, it could be very dangerous. So uh, we made an adjustment, then the patient uh, had other medical problems. So uh, for, uh, from our perspective, luckily was in the hospital for a couple more days. So we were able to observe this and we, we observed that there was no further under sensing and there was 100% capture. And so uh, basically the patient uh, did well. All right, we're at a little past a quarter of the hour. So I think we'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry we had to cancel last week, just wasn't feeling well, but uh, we're back. Okay, I will see everybody uh, in a few minutes at sign out. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dr. Pass. Thank you. Thank you.